Welcome to Protecting the Planet. I'm Ben Tracy. Recycling is something a lot of us do, making it one of the largest concerted worldwide efforts to help our environment. But the United States recycles only 32% of the trash we produce every year, so there's still so much more we could do. In this episode, we'll take you to Bali, where a man built a house completely out of plastic waste. And while solar panels and wind turbines are rapidly reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, millions of tons of wind blades and panels are now ending up in landfills every year. But we begin with the story of plastic and how its creation in the 1950s has arguably done more harm than good. David Pogue has more. In the 1950s, a new material burst onto the scene that would change the world forever. The ingenious alchemy of coal and oil provides the material. Ingenious machinery presses and stamps and molds the material into a wide variety of products. Yes, it was plastic. Cheap, durable, sanitary, strong, and light. So how many raw categories of plastics are there? Oh, wow, literally thousands. Because Fred Betke is the founder of Delta Pacific Products, which makes plastic parts for medical instruments. Okay, so welcome to the factory. Thank you. We're all ready to serve cafeteria lunches now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Almost everything plastic starts out as pellets. They come in every color under the sun, which is why Betke keeps them carefully in separate boxes. So what do you pay me not to dump some of this in Please don't do that. <laughs> Delta Pacific's clients specify the exact design of the parts they want. Here, hot plastic gets injected into this heavy steel mold. Later, it comes out as something like this. After 65 years of making plastic, we've pretty much mastered the art. What we haven't yet figured out is what to do with plastic once we're done with it. It lasts a really long time. It doesn't <laughs> biodegrade, so it just sits there. Roland Geyer, professor of environmental science at UC Santa Barbara, has studied how much plastic we throw away. We have statistics reaching all the way back to the dawn of plastic mass production, 1950. And if we add it all together, it's 8.3 billion metric tons. <laughs> so if, if we take that and spread it out evenly over California, the <laughs> entire state of California would be covered. And uh, that would be an ugly sight. About 70% of our discarded plastic winds up in open dumps or landfills like this one. So plastic bag probably used once between the cash register and the car, and then how long will it be here in the landfill? It will be with us for hundreds of years. But some plastic winds up in an even worse place, the ocean. Every single year, somewhere between 5 and 12 million metric tons of plastic waste enters the ocean. Plastic in the ocean has a tendency to break down into ever smaller pieces. And these tiny pieces then get taken up even lower down in the food chain. So we know that um, it ends up on our dinner plates. There's plastic in my food? There is plastic in your food, plastic in your sea salt, and there is plastic coming out of your tab. In fact, at this rate, the World Economic Forum predicts that by 2050, our oceans will contain more plastic than fish. But wait a minute. Don't most people recycle plastic? Not exactly. Geyer says that as of 2017, the world recycles only about 9% of all our plastic. Even if you're good about using your recycling bin, your plastic may never actually get recycled. Its first stop is a material recovery facility where metal, glass, paper, and plastic get sorted. We sort everything. So we will sort hangers, we'll sort plastic film, we will sort soda bottles, pill bottles, and make individual bales of each plastic. Ah, okay. Sunil Bagaria is the co-founder of GDB International, a corporate recycling facility in New Jersey. Then it is going to another factory, which is then washing it, grinding it, pelletizing it. Then from there it will go to another company, which will make another product or maybe blowing another bottle. It's easy and economical to recycle clean, pure plastic. But well over half the plastic we throw in our bins is contaminated by food or paper labels or other materials. For 30 years, we've had an easy solution for disposing of that dirty plastic, 
And what is the role of China in all of this? Ah, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> China was buying 50% of all plastic scrap in the world. That continued for say 20, 30 years. And then there was a, I think a movie made by somebody. Plastic China. Plastic China. The 2017 documentary Plastic China illustrated the brutal truth about the contaminated plastic that developed nations were selling to China. It showed a desperately poor Chinese family eking out a living by hand sorting these mountains of plastic trash. So the Chinese government, the Communist Party is waking up and saying, what, why, why are we doing this? There's some, some national pride. We, yes, we yes. want to be the world's dumping ground. Yes. So the Chinese government announced a new policy. China stopped accepting other countries' plastic, unless it's impossibly pure. A lot of plastic comes to recyclers like Bulgaria all mixed together, impossible to separate cost-effectively. So what happens now to the plastic we used to ship to China? Not much. A lot of it's just piling up here in the States. We still have large volumes of the types of plastic that nobody will buy, sitting, waiting for somebody to buy them. Clay Warner is the recycling manager at Garten Services in Salem, Oregon. And then you have to decide how long you're going to hold on to it before you end up throwing it away. The town had to ask the public to stop putting certain plastic types into their recycling bins. Uh, first initial reaction from the public was outrage. What do you mean we can't recycle these plastics? Meanwhile, smaller recycling centers are simply going out of business. If you were selling it to China, there was some revenue coming. Now if you're sending it to landfill, sending it to landfill costs money. So not only now you're not earning, now you're paying to get rid of it. Oh. Still, Roland Geyer points out that we have overcome environmental nightmares before. We banned leaded gasoline. We managed to tackle ozone depletion. So I think humankind has a long history of creating big environmental problems, but I think we're also starting to have a track record of solving environmental problems. Some larger facilities, like Sunil Bagaria's, have decided to process the contaminated plastic themselves. Earlier we were making money by selling it to China. Now we are making more money by keeping this here, sorting it, and making plastic pellets out of it. This China problem is a blessing in disguise. In the big picture, though, it will take effort from every stakeholder to fix the plastics problem. Recycler Clay Warner says that government should play a part. I do think, in my own opinion, that um, we do need to ban certain plastics and packaging. Sunil Bagaria says that corporations play a part. It's like, like McDonald's. They have announced that by 2025, all our packaging will be made from recycled plastic. And plastic parts maker Fred Becky says that plastic manufacturers themselves play a part. Yes, the industry is trying to address it. Polymers are being developed that, as you know, the knives and spoons and forks that we see in some of the fast foods, they've gone to those polymers, which are biodegradable. It has to happen. I mean, this is all we've got, right? So Yeah, that's right. We cannot imagine life without plastics, but we cannot continue to lead our life the way we are. It's not like, oh, let's use this planet Earth, then we will move to another planet. <laughs> this is what we have. We need to take care of this. Coming up, a little house with a big heart. Welcome back. Globally, only 9% of plastic waste is recycled. Well, one man in Bali decided to recycle plastic waste by building his house out of cups, straws, and bags. Here's Tina Kraus. Welcome, guys, to my recycled tiny home. Gary Benchaglib is right at home in his own plastic paradise, a dwelling made from 35,000 plastic bags. Fully equipped with a king-size bed, a kitchen, and a full-on bathroom. The plastic pad sits on a beach on the resort island of Bali, where he collected the trash. Fully off the grid, powered by solar. So this is the battery storage area. The bed frame, furniture, and kitchen cabinets were all built from plastic cups and straws. Why not recycle the plastics that we're collecting from the rivers and really show what we can do with it? 
Benchagib started a movement two years ago, cleaning up Bali's iconic beaches, clogged rivers, and illegal dumping sites to stop the trash from reaching the ocean. Now his upcycling trend has hit one of the island's high-end beach clubs, where workers are busy building tables, chairs, and all kinds of accessories out of waste. How do we minimize what goes to landfill? Because at the end of the day, it's not waste until it ends up in a landfill. Back at home, Ben Chagib says he's living proof everyone can do their part to help the planet. The final environmental decision we will make is what we want done with our bodies after we die. Well, there's a new option considered to be better for the planet. It's referred to as human composting and I visited one of the first places in the U.S. to offer this service. In the garden of her home in Bellingham, Washington, Marie Eaton is always able to find something she lost. When I come out to garden, uh, he's there. And every time I'm under one of the maples, I think, oh yeah, Wayne, you're here. Her brother, Wayne Dodge, was also an avid gardener with a fondness for Japanese maple trees. But in 2021, he fell down the stairs and became a quadriplegic. A few months later, the 71-year-old doctor got pneumonia. As a physician, he knew what that meant. You know, they call pneumonia the old man's friend, and he chose that way to leave. And we were devastated to lose him, but um, understood that choice. You were very close. Very close, very close to him. Instead of being buried or cremated, Wayne had chosen a relatively new alternative, natural organic reduction, more simply known as human composting. It's a natural process that transforms the body into soil. So I wanted to show you what the soil actually looks like. It's beautiful, like beautiful, beautiful mulch um, at the end of the process. Some of it is spread under the Japanese maples in her yard. What do you say to people who will hear this and say, that just sounds a little creepy or a little strange? So if I might invite them to think a little bit about what traditional burial involves, which is embalming a body, putting it inside a lead-lined coffin, and putting it into a concrete vault in the ground as though we were pretending the person's not dead. That to me is a much more creepy than this process of naturally um, becoming part of the soil again. For her brother, that process happened here at Recompose in Seattle, the first human composting facility in the country. This is the gathering space. Katrina Spade is the founder and CEO. She showed us the space where families can hold a memorial service as their loved one is covered with organic plant material such as straw and wood chips. We typically have the person's body laid here and at the end of the ceremony we pass the person's body through the threshold vessel. On the other side is this array of eight foot long stainless steel containers in which more natural material is added to aid in decomposition. How long will this take for each individual body? Well, everybody's different, but about 30 to 40 days inside the vessel. And we're creating this perfect environment to facilitate that transformation into soil. Bone at that point is reduced mechanically to sort of like a sand-like substance. Spade is a former architecture student who was instrumental in Washington State, becoming the first in the nation to legalize human composting in 2019. Five other states followed, and there are now a handful of companies offering this service. Human composting is considered an environmentally friendly choice, a way to minimize death's carbon footprint. Today, most Americans choose to be cremated or buried, which involves burning fossil fuels and toxic chemicals. Do you find that the environmental footprint of this is part of what's driving some folks' decisions? Yes. So if you've lived your whole life thinking about that and trying to make a difference environmentally, it makes sense, too, to think about your environmental impact after you die. But the New York State Catholic Conference opposes the practice, saying it is more appropriate for vegetable trimmings and eggshells than for human bodies. I know that this is an incredibly respectful process, and for so many people, it's more than that. It's deeply meaningful. It is like giving your body back to nature. Yeah, we, we truly get to be nature eventually. 
simple natural burials were standard until the Civil War, when soldiers were embalmed so their bodies could be returned to their families. Abraham Lincoln's funeral made the process popular, and luxurious caskets became the new standard. Human composting is one of the few innovations in death care in more than a century. About 300 people have used Recompose's services so far, which cost about $7,000. The soil created, which fills the bed of a pickup truck, can be taken by the family or donated to forest conservation efforts. Wayne is all over Seattle, planted under many, many Japanese maple trees. Marie Eaton's brother's soil was given to family and friends to sustain the trees he so loved. She finds comfort in knowing that his death continues to create new life. Every time I come outside here and see the maples, I'm reminded of this wonderful, wonderful man. Up next, an innovative way to recycle glass. With limited glass recycling programs in Louisiana, one couple found a new way to recycle it in their own backyard. Jesse Mitchell has more. They're on the grind here in Scott, Louisiana. And now it's going to get a little loud. Tina Crapsey and her partner Don Vincent are crushing it. Crushing glass. When they stopped recycling glass, it just didn't make any sense to me to throw it in the garbage. A metal worker by trade, Crapsy spent months of trial and error to produce her own solution, the annihilator. And make a batch. We can crush nine wine bottles in about six seconds. The local government ended its glass recycling program, in part because the newer machines could not sort glass without contamination from food and other recyclable items. Even though recycling has increased across the country, glass recycling has decreased over the past decade. I can see how challenging it would be on a larger scale because it's pretty challenging on even just the small scale. The glass recycling process can be slow. Bottles soak for days to loosen labels for a clean slate. It's tedious, huh? It is. We make it fun, though. Yeah, we do. How do you do that? We have friends over <laughs> and we yeah. have drinks. <laughs> You're contributing to the pile. Yes. <laughs> then the selection for the perfect blend. It looks good. It's like painting. The finished product, a sparkling mulch that is safe for landscaping. Their signature color, Backyard Sapphire, the company's namesake. We sift that out and then we get the, the pebble blend. And then some of the large pieces end up in our uh, beach glass. The mulch stays put and filters water as it rains, solving two problems with one simple idea, an idea that has earned the couple praise from environmental regulators across the state. We've actually got a Louisiana weatherproof uh, landscaping yeah. that, that might make it through a storm. And make others see the beauty of recycling. Solar panels typically have a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, but some are being thrown out after just three to four years in favor of more advanced models. But now new companies are working to recycle panels and wind turbine blades so they don't end up in landfills. This panel is not necessarily suitable for reuse. At this solar panel recycling plant in Yuma, Arizona, Hey, I like talking trash. <laughs> Dwight Clark oversees the machines that can process more than 7,000 used solar panels a day. Solar is the fastest growing source of energy in the U.S. The panels last for 25 to 30 years, but more than 90% of used solar panels end up in landfills. By 2030, the amount due to be retired would cover about 3,000 football fields. There was no planning to handle the waste. Adam Sagai is CEO of the simply named We Recycle Solar in Yuma. We said, what can we come up with that just gets right to the point? You found it. He says a tsunami of solar waste is coming, and his company hopes to ride the wave by recycling or reusing nearly 70 million pounds of panels each year. They are mostly made of glass and aluminum, valuable and reusable materials. 
As solar panels improve, many are being ripped out long before they age out. How old are these? About three to four years old. There's absolutely a market for someone to take three to four year old panels. I would take three to four year old panels, put them on my house. Exactly, <laughs> 90% efficiency. The problem is the trash, not the technology. Scientists say renewable energy, mainly solar and wind power, is key to combating climate change, allowing us to ditch fossil fuels and their planet warming carbon emissions. But the answer blowing in the wind raises an uncomfortable question. What is all this stuff? This is our storage of windmill blades before we process them. This quarry outside of Louisiana, Missouri is filled with decommissioned wind turbines and nearly 200 foot long blades chopped into several pieces. They are built not to break. There's balsa wood, there's fiberglass, there's the resin. But it's Julie Angelo's job to break them. She's with Veolia, a company that figured out how to cut these blades down to size so they can be recycled. So if you weren't recycling all of this, what would happen? What would or what also does happen, unfortunately, um, a lot of those end up in landfill. These windmill blades are being buried in the ground in Casper, Wyoming. By 2050, the world's wind industry is estimated to produce more than 47 million tons of blade waste each year, a black eye for green energy. Veolia spent months finding the right mix of industrial shredders to tear them apart. So from a massive windmill turbine blade to this. To this, yes. They sell the blade remains to cement companies, which use it to fuel their kilns instead of coal. They say that cuts their planet warming carbon emissions by nearly 30%. Overall, the renewable recycling industry is small and it's still cheaper to send the waste to landfills. But in Europe, used blades are being remade into everything from playgrounds to bike shelters to bridges. So far, Veolia has processed nearly 3,000 blades. You took something that's supposed to be indestructible and you've destroyed it. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and the renewable revolution should provide an endless supply of business. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. Thanks for watching Protecting the Planet. I'm Ben Tracy.